what makes it quite interesting is it doesn't really build on the previous learning units. Uh, the previous learning units looked at the interaction between the goods market and the financial markets um, and then the output level. And that was really based in, well, either closed or open economy, so we looked at exchange rates, et cetera. Now, this learning unit uh, really deals with firms, wages, and and prices. So where previously we ignored the fact that firms have to respond to an increase in the, the demand of goods, um, it, it, this one really focuses on that, looking at, um, well, the wage and price determination. And this learning unit is important uh, because it's a building block for learning unit nine, which then starts tying everything um, together again. So, uh, yeah, you don't really need to know much about learning units one to seven to understand this learning unit, but it is important for the next learning unit that, that ties it together. So at the end of the day, you should be able, by the end of this learning unit, ex to explain the wage and price setting relationships and be able to um, determine the natural rate of unemployment. And you can use all of this by using the labor market model and, and using that model to also then uh, explain, well, what changes or what causes a change to the natural rate of unemployment. Okay, next slide. So the first important concept, it's wage determination. So it, I mean, wages are really set in a, a lot of different ways. They can be set via collective bargaining, so unions negotiating, I don't know, entry level wages for mine workers, or it can be between you and an employer. When um, when an employer wants to employ you, you negotiate what wage you want to to receive, and once a year you negotiate well what increase you you plan to get. Um, so. I think the first important concept is that wages are typically set higher than an employee's re reservation wage. Now, that reservation wage is the wage that you prefer to be employed rather than unemployed. Remember, not everybody needs or wants to be employed. Uh, it doesn't need to make sense for you to actually travel to work. It still needs to make sense to, to go through the inconvenience of actually having to spend a whole day in an office or at a site um, lifting heavy things or whatever the case is. Now, um, so, so, so that's that's the first concept. So typically your wages are set higher than the reservation wage. Now, the, the next important concept, and this is something that will tie into the model once we get to the model, is bargaining power. So um, an employee can have bargaining power and that your bargaining power is higher if um, you're skilled or more skilled uh, because there's less people that can do the kind of work that you do. So it's really depending on the nature of the job, whether it's skilled or unskilled, um, but also labor market conditions, which is really the, the what we focus on in this learning unit. And um, that's mainly to do with the unemployment rate and the unemployment rate, I mean, I think everybody kind of has an idea what it is. Um, at the end, I do have in the appendix some um, um, information that's South Africa specific, but that's really um, people that are of, uh, well, within the right age group that are looking for a job but can't find a job. So people that are unemployed, so not people that are still studying like most of you on the call um, or uh, um, people that decide to be a stay-at-home mother, et cetera. It's people that can't find a job but want to find a job. Uh, who's unemployed and then that's divided by the total labor force that gets you to the unemployment rate. Um, but that influences the bargaining power. A higher unemployment rate means it's more difficult to find a job, um, so you don't have a lot of bargaining power. Um, the probability of finding a suitable replacement, so if you're the only person that can do a certain, um, a, a certain job because you're the only person with that skill, you have a lot of bargaining power because they can't find a suitable replacement to replace you. Um, oh yeah, also just things like labor market laws and regulations also give you a, a can give you or take away bargaining power. Um, another important concept, it doesn't really play into the, the model that we talk about um, when we get to it, but it is the efficiency wages. So that just says that, well, regardless of what your bargaining position is, a firm may pay you more than what your reservation wage is due to factors such as increasing productivity or um, just to try and decrease the turnover rate of workers. Because if you always pay the minimum, um, as soon as somebody else wants to steal 
or you, they can just a little bit more money. So you actually want to pay up for somebody that's becoming more efficient or just to make sure you don't lose the turnover rate and the internal skills in the company. The concept that we'll deal with next, is, which is the important one for the model, is wage determination. Um, so I'll just go to the next slide. So in terms of wage determination, inflation and unemployment, um, the first thing with wage determination, so how do we determine what the wage will be, what the salary would be for the employee? Um, and, and for everybody on the call, I didn't mention it at the start, but if you want to interrupt me with questions, feel free to put your hand up, or if I don't see your hand, just interrupt me. I'm happy to do that. But um, maybe if we can just start with the first section which is really wage determination so this this is a very important section so we express wages in nominal terms and not in terms of goods and services so this is um the first important concept i would say in that while we say we want to receive 100 rand an hour we don't say we want to receive one willie's chicken an hour no uh, so so that's the first thing because so we expect it in uh, nominal terms but however we do want to be able to um keep well to be able to purchase one willis chicken with that hundred rand that we we bargained for so if the price of a chicken goes up by 10 percent actually to um receive 110 rand as my wage because that's that's what i want to buy for one hour's worth of labor but i can't ask them to pay me a chicken i can only ask them to pay me in rands so that that's the first thing so our what we want to obtain or the targeted real wage is linked to inflation or price expectation so if i think the price of the chicken is going up so pe is um not in the eastern cape it's the price expectations so if i think the price expectations are or prices will rise the wage that i'm going to ask for is going to increase and if I think price expectations will fall, so if I think the um, uh, the price of chicken is coming down, I'm willing to accept a lower wage. So I'm not going to fight so hard to receive more money because I know, look, the prices are coming down. I'll still be able to feed my family. Um, so that that's the first relationship. So what you'll see is it's a positive relationship. So as price expectations increase, wage expectations or wa the wage demand would increase. Same thing on the other side. Uh, the, um, it, it's in the same direction. So if we say it's a positive relationship, it means it's in the same direction. Um, yeah. So if the economy is in a recession um, or it, we've got a slow growth environment like we've got currently and firms are reducing their workforce due to a decline in sales or profitability uh, and unemployment increases, then your bargaining power decreases because if there's more people unemployed, um, it's easier for firms to find uh, re suitable replacements so you don't have as much bargaining power so the wage you will ask for or, or can ask for would be less irrespective of your price expectations so um, generally if, if the economy is doing well then you can uh, unemployment would decrease you can ask for higher wages so that's a negative relationship it's in opposite directions if unemployment goes up wage demands go down due to the um, change in the bargaining power. So, so always think about it from the the employee's perspective. If unemployment moves in a certain direction, can you act, uh, are you in a better or worse position? Can you ask for better or or um, well for higher wages or not? Then another factor influencing w what you can ask for for wages is in what we call or uh, kind of group everything else as, as institutional factors. We represent this as debt, but institutional factors is basically everything else that's not prices or unemployment rate that affects the bargaining power of employees. So that's things like unemployment insurance, um, especially in developed markets, you've got quite good unemployment insurance. So let's say in Canada or America or in Europe. Um, so over there, you, if they do fire you, you have three or six months worth of payments coming your way or social security that you're not as afraid of losing your job um, as you are in, in certain other countries like, like ourselves where you don't really get a lot of benefits or the government doesn't really pay a lot. So uh, things like that, minimum wages. So that automatically increases the nominal wage at a given um, employment rate. Now, it can have effects on the employment rate, but it does increase wages labor laws collective bargaining all these things can affect the bargaining power at the end of the day um now as we said they're represented by z 
and um, we say this has a positive relationship. So the increase in Z implies an increase in the nominal wage demands. So, so that's really what, what we talk about, about institutional factors. Okay, so at the end of the day, this is the wage function, what it looks like. So W, which is wages, is equal to price expectations, which we said there's a positive relationship, uh, the expected price level, and then it's a function of um, unemployment rate and institutional factors. So remember the institutional factors as well, the institutional factors at a given unemployment rate. So that's why we put it in this function brackets and not just separately. But the, the important thing is to either, well, preferably not memorize the relationship, preferably understand the relationship. Um, I always found with economics, it's better to try and understand the rationale behind something and not just learn it um, like a parrot. So, but at the end of the day, you've got a positive relationship. So if price expectations go up, wage um, demands go up and the same on the downside, a negative relationship with unemployment and wages. So if unemployment rate goes up, wage demand goes down um, and vice versa. If unemployment rate decreases, wages go up. And institutional factors, it's just a positive relationship. That's the way we uh, kind of define it. But um, yeah, so if things like um, unemployment insurance increases, then and and that benefits the bargaining position of workers, that um, that that would increase the wages. Okay, so so that's the the first side of it and and uh, trust me we're going to go through the second side of it and then put it all together and it's going to make a lot more sense so if you're feeling lost at the moment don't worry that's just the first thing we talked about wages what influences wages um and and we'll make some simplifying assumptions later on to put it all together so if you are feeling lost don't worry too much about it yet the price equation right so there are two things in in this this model that we're busy building up to. It's wages and prices. Now, wages is what um, employees ask for. Prices is what firms end up charging for the goods and services they offer, which the employees at the end of the day buy, right? So, um, but at the end of the day, so first of all, on the price equation, so we derive this price equation for economy based on a cost plus profit basis. So, this is. A simplifying assumption, if any of you do go further with your economics degrees, etc., you'll learn much more complex models, but assumption, it's a cost plus profit basis, right? So what employee, uh, what a firm does um, is they they look at what thing, something costs them and they add a mark up to that. So we'll, we'll see that when we get to this equation at the bottom. Some simplifying assumptions. So we say labor is the only factor of production used. So we only use labor. Think of, uh, I don't know, let's say somebody building a, uh, building something that's probably not right because you have to buy the inputs, but let's say somebody doing a service, um, uh, somebody cutting your hair. They only really use one hour to cut one person's hair and that that's it, right? So labor is the only factor of production used. Um, so Y is equal to A N, now, why is there two letters here and not just one? It's because we also say, well, there's labor productivity. So do I cut one person's hair in an hour or two persons hair? So that, that's why we say AN, right? So, so N is employment. So let's say that's one hours of labor. You can think of it that way for one person and A is how many people's hair you cut in that hour. Um, but don't worry, we're gonna simplify it further and say, well, the production function implies that the labor productivity or the output per worker is constant or equal to one. So let's just say um, no matter what you do at this point, you can only cut one person's hair an hour. So A is equal to one. So the production function is actually just Y is equal to N, right? Because if you multiply N times one, it's just N. So that's this another simplifying um, assumption that we make, right? So this implies that to double the amount of output, if we want to cut two people's hair, we're going to be working for two hours, right? So the marginal product of labor is one. So if we want to cut two people's hair, if we want to cut the third person's hair, it's another hour. So then you've got to work for three hours, right? If you or you've got to employ somebody, another person to come in to work for that for an additional hour. So th so that's kind of the, what it implies if we make those assumptions. So the marginal cost of the extra unit of output is the wage paid for the additional labor. So 
what what does it cost me as the firm? So I'm I'm the barber shop owner. What does it cost me to um, cut a second person's hair? Well, I have to pay somebody to come and cut that person's hair for that hour. So if I want to make a profit out of it, so the price equation implies that the the price of a unit is equal to the wage times the markup. So I want to make some profit out of it. I mean, I'm the owner. I've got a pay for the electricity, et cetera, et cetera, but I also just want to make a profit. So the price is equal to one plus the markup, which is a percentage number, times the wage. And uh, once we put numbers to it, you'll see it makes a, uh, it might make a lot more sense. I know some people don't like seeing formulas this way. Um, yeah, I tend to like it, but some people might not. You want to see the actual numbers in there, and then it starts making sense. I think that's on the next page. But if we look at this formula, you'll see, I think, two important things. The first thing is if M increases, right? So if M goes up, the price goes up because if this increases, that's a positive relationship between the markup and the price. So if I want to make more profit as the owner, I've got to charge people more because I'm still paying the um, employee the same amount of money, right? So that, that's the first relationship to, to take note of. So if the markup increases, the price increases um, and vice versa, if I drop the markup, the price drops. Then the second important thing as well, if wages increase, the price increases. So if I pay my employees more, if I go from paying my employee 100 bucks an hour to 110 bucks an hour, and I add my profit margin of let's say 10%, the price would increase because I need to charge more for the service now to make that same percentage profit and recover the wage that's that's being paid. So prices is equal to um, one plus markup times wages. So positive relationship between markup and prices and wages and prices. Okay, now as an example, yeah, there's there's some definitions here at the, the top, but we already kind of dealt with those. But as an example, right, so for those that don't like the formulas, um, this might make more sense. So the wage rate per worker is 50 rand. So I pay the um, the person cutting the hair 50 rand as the employer. Um, the employer produces one unit, so cut one person's hair. The markup is 20%. So I want to make a 20% profit off this. So the price I charge, is equal to one plus markup times cost of production, which is the wage. That means one plus 0 0.2. I would recommend for everybody to learn how to, if you see 20%, that means 20 divided by 100, which is 0 0.2. So it helps to kind of feel like you can interchange a 0 0.2 and a 20% quite easily. It means exactly the same thing, but okay. So the price per unit, one plus markup, times cost of production. So one plus 0 0.2, which is my 20% time, times, got an X in there, but that's just the times 50 Rand, the wage I um, pay for the worker. So that means I've got to charge 60 bucks for a haircut, right? So 60 Rand for a haircut enables me to pay the employee 50 Rand and make my profit of, well, in this case, 10 Rand profit. So, Here's two examples. Well, what happens if other things, uh, if we move the markup or the wage? So first of all, what happens if the markup increases to 40%? Well, we just replace, I've put it in bold here, but that 0 0.2 in that formula gets replaced with the 0 0.4, which is 40%. Uh, that means 70 Rand would be the price of the unit. And that's what we said. We said the markup and prices are positively correlated. So you need to be able to calculate this. There is, I think it's activity 8.3 has a couple of examples to play around around with this. We're not going to go through that tonight um, or the answers are in the study guide. If you do have any questions on that activity or the, the ones we're not dealing with tonight, I mean, just post them on the uh, discussion forum. But if you look at this, right, 40% goes in there. It's positively correlated. You end up paying 70 Rand for the haircut and the firm or the owner of the hair shop gets a slightly bigger profit. Now, what if the markup was 20%, the same as what it was initially, but we paid the employee 10 Rand more. So we pay, oh, sorry, 20 Rand more. We paid the employee 70 Rand, right? So what would the price be then? Well, if we do that, we still use the one plus 0 0.2, so the 20% markup. 
the wage is now 70 rand that means the price is 84 rand right so we just replace the 50 rand with 70 rand in the formula um make sure when you put the yeah, other this is um for those that don't use calculators that frequently make sure that you um put the one plus 0 0.2 in brackets when you calculate these because if you type this in without the brackets into your calculator you're probably going to get the wrong result so this is just um for, for those of you uh, that don't use calculators frequently just put remember to put that in brackets um or just say 1.2 so do the maths in your head and say 1.2 or 1.4 because you know 1 plus 0 0.4 is 1.4 and same with 1 plus 0 0.2 right but um Again, so what we said in the previous page about the relationship, the wage and the price being positively correlated, this shows it mathematically. If the wage goes from 50 to 70 Rand, the price goes from 60 to 84 Rand, showing that it's positively correlated. So I think that that gives us a good sense of price determination and wage determination. We haven't put in numbers on the wage determination um per, per se but for prices we've been able to calculate them and we we understand the relationships rather than just studying them so uh, the next thing to look at is the real wage setting relationship so we we understand the first two building blocks right so how do wages get set how do prices get set but remember initially i said look at the end of the day you can't ask the employee to pay you in willie's chicken you've got a um, depending on what happens to prices, you're bargaining to be able to buy a certain amount of food, etc., for your family, right? So, what we're doing over here is we're simplifying again the the well, putting an assumption to simplify this to really get to uh, the real wage, right? So, the real wage, what real means? Okay, so nominal means just the actual amount as you see it on your pay slip. Real means um how many chickens you can buy so it's the wage divided by price right so that's the way to think about it wages divided by the price uh, prices or the price level so you at the end of the day it it takes out the movement in prices but the first assumption we make here is that the expected price level so remember you think when you you're bargaining for a wage you say i think prices will go up by a certain amount you actually don't know um, but over here, we assume that what you think is equal to what happens to prices. So prices is price PE is equal to P. That means from our first formula that looked like this, except we had a PE in there for price expectations, um, we just write it out without the E for expectations, right? So wages is equal to prices times a function of the unemployment rate and institutional factors. Okay, so now we want to get to the real wage. As I said before, the real wage is equal to the wage divided by prices. So we just, well, divide by P on both sides. So you end up having wage over price is equal to the function, right? So um, that that's really the real wage setting relationship. So the real wage setting re re um, relationship can be represented um, as per the graph on the left. So that's diagram 8.1 in your study guide so at various levels of unemployment let's say at an employment level of five percent um we can draw a line up we get to where it intersects the ws curve which is the wage setting curve and that gives us a certain real wage 0 0.9 real wage now you'll see in the the table below uh, how they are calculated effectively the way to read this is you have different nominal wages per unit uh, per labor unit the p or the price level is set at 960 i know it doesn't state it properly on the chart but it's set at 960 that's just w over p p is equal to 960 and then if you take w divided by p you get to the different real wages at a different and at the various unemployment rates. So that's the real wage setting relationship, right? So it, it also says, well, for a given le uh, price level and a given bargaining position, which is Z, so we're assuming if Z doesn't change, right? The real wage setting relationship is derived by considering the impact of a change in the unemployment rate. 
and the targeted real wage demand of workers. So higher unemployment, that's an you can see that there's the relationship. Higher unemployment, so unemployment going from five to fifteen percent means the real wage de decreases. So a higher unemployment rate means you get paid less in real terms. So not just less in nominal terms, also less in real terms. You can buy less chickens, it's not just less rands. So looking at activity 8.4, um, which helps you to be able to actually draw this and then kind of understand it. And yeah, so so looking at um, the first part of activity 8.4, it says use the information in the table to construct a wage setting curve and explain why it's downward sloping. So what we do is we it's it's effectively the same numbers we calculated previously, what, what you can see um, on the previous page. Um, but what you'll see is, is just you, you, to actually construct it, you need to be able to draw the three dots on there, A, B, and C, and then draw a line, but a little bit of a curved line uh, through them. But what it says that is at an employment rate of five, you've got a real wage of 9.6, right? That's what, what it tells you there in the table. So that's your first dot, dot A. Then at an employment rate of 10%, which is then that 10, you've got a real wage of 8.3. And at an employment rate of 15, you've got a real wage of uh, 0.63. So those are three dots. Remember, we draw this as a curve, not just as a straight line. If you do have to draw this um, for whatever reason, it's just because it, it will never actually intersect the the various axes. Um, it will always be be a bit curved. So th that's that's how you would actually draw it and and um, yeah, th that's how you would draw it. So in terms of well, what happens to the wage setting relationship that we had in this chart, um, what would happen if legislation provides workers with more bargaining power? So if you've got more bargaining power, so let's say um, more unemployed, unemployment benefits, right? So the government says, look, you get fired, similar to what maybe happened during COVID in certain countries. If, if you get fired, we'll pay your salary for a couple of months or they would have said to companies look we'll we'll actually pay the salaries of people so like that furlough program they had in in the uk um that gives you more bargaining power so more bargaining power is not just a move along the curve so a change in the unemployment rate is a move along the curve so you move from a b to c right that that's a change in the unemployment rate but a change in bargaining position shifts the curve so now at an unemployment rate of 5%, um, instead of being at the 0 0.96, you are, because the sh curve shifted well to the right or upwards, depending on how you want to read it, because it's to the right and upwards, um, but it's higher than that 0.96, right? Because the curve shift upwards, you've got more bargaining power. That means you get, you, you're able to receive a higher real wage at that given level of unemployment. So now in this example, the way they drew it here, and the answer is that, well, at that 10%, you're able to receive the same real wage you were previously able to receive at an unemployment rate of 5% because of that move in the curve. And at then at 15, it's the same real wage you were able to accept last time at 10 uh, at a 10% unemployment rate. So it's just important to understand that well, what causes a shift in the curve and what does it actually mean? A shift in the curve is better bargaining position, a shift to the right. If it's worst bargaining position, it would be the opposite. It would be a shift to the left. Um, and then well, what does that actually mean for the real wage? Well, if you can also think about this logically if you could ask the question. If you've got better bargaining position, do you think your wages will be able to go up or down? Uh, I think it's relatively logical. If you've got better bargaining position, you we should be able to receive a higher real wage, right? So if you ever get stuck on a question like this, I mean, economics for the most part, in my experience, is quite logical in terms of um, most of the things. You can kind of think your way through it. So um, you can always second guess your your answers in economics. So you, you can do something and then you look at this and just take a step back and say, well, does this actually make sense? If my uh, bargaining position increases, uh, what, should I get a higher or lower wage? Well, higher at that given level of unemployment. Um, so that's the first curve is really this wage setting curve, the WS curve. 
Now, in terms of prices, right? So we talked about price setting before. The P is equal to one plus M times wage, right? So the uh, price is look up times the wage, right? We talked about that before. Now, because we've now made this assumption of prices and price expectation being the same, we can actually put it all on one chart. But okay, how do we actually draw this in terms of the well, and on the same chart, unemployment on the x-axis and real wages, so W over P, real wages on the y-axis. What happens to the the um, so, sorry, how do we set the or draw the price second relationship? So first thing is, well, we can write this. We can divide everything by, by W, right? So P divided by W is then equal to one plus the markup, right? So that's, we're almost there. We've got P over W. We actually just need to invert that, right? So we need to say, well, uh, if you invert that, to put the W at the top so that it's W over P, effectively you're taking one divided by, you're multiplying it, uh, sorry, so you're taking, yeah, on, on the right hand side you say one divided by one plus the markup, so you just inverted that, and then on the left hand side you inverted the W and the P. So now this is what that relationship looks like. If we were to draw that, the first, um, the price setting relationship, if we were to to draw that in terms of this chart, that is your equation. Now, the first thing to note is it's not, it has no relationship with the unemployment rate really, right? So there's no U in that. It doesn't matter what the unemployment rate is, this actually remains the same. And it's so at the end of the day, it's just a horizontal line. No matter at what unemployment rate you are, the price stays the exact same according to this this formula that we've got, right? So at the end of the day, the real wage is implied by the price setting or implied by the price setting is equal to one divided by, and then brackets again, remember the brackets, one plus the markup. Um, so it's just basically a horizontal line. And and that's quite interesting because it's, it, it, that, that's just horizontal lines. So it doesn't matter what actually happens to the employment rate, the, um, doesn't affect the prices or the real uh, the the price setting relationship rather. As we did in activity 8.4, in 8.4 we dealt a bit with well changes to the wage setting relationship. So what does it mean to uh, shift down or up and uh, oh, sorry movement along or shift up or down? Now let's look at well practically what is what happens to the price setting equation, right? So okay, well. First step, so uh, the assumptions we're making, okay, the nominal wage is equal to 100 and the markup is 10%. So first of all, what happens to the real wage if the non nominal wage increases to 110? So remember your formula for the real wage. Real wage is equal to W over P. It's a one divided by one plus the markup. Now, that means it's uh, the real wage is not actually influenced by the nominal wage, if you look at it this way, because the real wage is W over P, right? It is equal to one over one plus M, and the markup stays 10% if the nominal wage increases to 110. So the real wage stays 0 0.9. So the company pays you, call it the one chicken's worth of money an hour. It doesn't matter what, uh, if you get a higher nominal wage, it just increases inflation at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you're still get only getting one chicken's worth of money. You're only getting one chicken's worth of real wage. So um, that that's an important thing to to note because I think a lot of people will get that wrong um, at, uh, if you just try to think through it maybe logically. You do have this formula to help you, right? So. Yeah, and I, th I think that that's one of the issues we have when we talk about collective bargaining, etc. Because I always say that we want twenty percent increases um, as a union. Otherwise, we go on strike. We go on strike for a week. We end up getting five percent in any case. But even if we got the twenty percent, if if everybody gets a twenty percent wage increase and nobody produces more chickens, you can still only buy the same amount of chickens. So th that's maybe the way to think through it logically. The nominal wage, what you actually end up getting on a big aggregate scale, doesn't really change the actual level of output you're able to consume. So yeah, that's maybe the way to think about it logically. Next up, what happens if the markup increases to 20%, right? 
So if the markup increases 20%, we know from our formula that real wage is equal to 1 over 1 plus M. So then the nominal, of uh, the real wage, sorry, would be 0 0.83. Now, graphically, which is also important to, to be able to do, you need to be able to calculate these and show it graphically. So the first one graphically is just that horizontal line at 0 0.9. The second one is now, well, that's a, a movement or a shift downwards of the price setting curve, right? So we move from PS to PS1. It's a move down because as the markup increases, if the firm tries to make more profit or, or, or increases the percentage profit that they want to make, um, the actual value of your wage goes down because in this, call it a circular, circular, uh, clicker, uh, yeah, economy that uh, you've got to buy the output that the firm produces, you can buy less output because the firm's taking out more profit, right? So um, that means the real wage goes down. And in the last one, if uh, the markup decreases to 5% versus the original 10%, uh, we can again calculate the real wage, we get to 0 0.95. And again, try, these, try to calculate these on your calculators if you get to different answers, I mean, just remember the brackets on the one plus M maybe um, that should get you through it. If you still struggle, I mean, you can always ask us um, to help you on the discussion forums. But yeah, that gets to 0.95. So that's an, a, ship, uh, a shift upwards in the PS curve. So important to calculate and understand shift. So markup increases, that's a negative relationship. You've got a decrease, markup decreases. Again, it's a negative relationship, meaning it's the opposite of so markup, um, decreases the PS curve shifts up. Putting it all together, right? So both of those lines, the WS line that which we drew and the PS line that we drew were effectively on the same axis, right? You had the, the real wage W over P on the left-hand side or on the Y-axis, and unemployment on the bottom axis. So you can put them on the same chart and have an intercept, which is over here at point B. Um, but yeah, so maybe starting off. So the equilibrium means, obviously it's generally in economics, the equilibrium is where the two intercept, but um, the equilibrium in this case means that the real wage chosen in wage setting is equal to the real wage implied by price setting, right? So when we decide on the wage setting, when you negotiate for your higher wage and you talk about the real wage for that level, given level of unemployment, at the end of the day, that needs to be the same as what price setting would imply. And that gets us to the natural rate of unemployment or the way we um, showed on the diagram is uh, U and then a small N next to it, so unemployment, the natural rate of unemployment. And the only place where the real wage chosen is equal to uh, in the wage setting and the real wage implied by price setting is the same is at the natural rate of unemployment. And that's at this point A, right? So at this point, price setting says this needs to be the real wage over there. And wage setting says, OK, well, at that level of unemployment, it's the same. So that's the natural rate of unemployment. At any other rate, such as over here at point B, uh, where you've got UN1 and WOP1, um, the, at any other rate like that, the, the workers will bargain for a different, or in this case, a higher real wage than the implied real wage. And that's not necessarily sustainable, um, and, and the model is not in equilibrium there, right? So um, at, at those levels, you might find the firms not being willing to pay that, or the firms might say, okay, well, at that level, we've got to um, increase or, or move our markups um, so that we, we find the balance. So that's not really sustainable, and that's not where the natural rate of unemployment is, right? So the, the other way to look at the natural rate of unemployment is just more of a definition or explaining it. It's the minimum unemployment rate that results from real or voluntary economic forces. So remember, unemployment rates are never zero. There's always reasons why 
there's an unemployment rate. So, um, I mean, it gets dealt with a bit in some of the definitions early on. and um, But in reality, it's a sum of all frictional and structural un um, unemployment when labor is in equilibrium. Now, frictional and structural, there's, there's reasons why there's unemployed. So people can be between jobs um, people might be not skilled or the workforce might not be skilled enough for the types of jobs that are out there. Um, but but the, so that's really what that natural rate of unemployment is trying to pick up. So it's it's a level of unemployment where everything is kind of in equilibrium and it's really just that frictional and structural reasons why maybe the economy is not has not grown enough to absorb the labor maybe the labor is not uh, skilled enough and then certain people are just made between jobs or or yeah uh, whatever the case might be trying to improve themselves even though they that shouldn't be picked up by unemployment that that's really where the natural rate of unemployment sits so i think the other next the next thing to think about as well what's the implication of this particular model right so you can say no but this model doesn't capture everything you want to capture and, and that's right this is a very simplified model that we're just trying to um, introduce you to these concepts obviously but what this implication is is that labor can only obtain a higher real wage so and remember real um the amount of chickens I can buy with the money um, at the end of the day. Uh, but you can only achieve a higher real wage by two if two things happen. That is if firms decrease their markup. So if the owners of firms reduce the amount of profit they charge on your labor, or if productivity increases, if I'm able to cut um, two people's hair in an hour, not one person's hair, then guess what? The, the firm owner will probably still pay me 50 rand per haircut but now i i get a lot more money at the end of the day that i and i can, i'm able to purchase a lot more goods and services um because my productivity increased so you cannot achieve a higher real wage just by asking your employer striking and asking the employer to pay you more because either the employer needs to decrease the profit they're willing to take for you to be able to achieve a higher real wage or at the end of the day, your productivity needs to increase. This is a very important concept that I think a lot of people don't completely understand necessarily that as a whole, this is true for an economy as a whole, right? So, um, and, and that's what this model is trying to explain. Just touching on some of the factors that will cause a change in the natural rate of unemployment. Uh, we we kind of introduced the natural rate of unemployment where, where these things, uh, where, where these two, uh, uh, well, where the two lines that uh, or the price setting relationship and the uh, wage setting relationship intersect. So the only way the natural rate of unemployment can change at the end of the day, right, is if one of these two curves shift. Because if you look at the chart on the previous diagram, the and natural rate of unemployment, if these curves stay where they are, it doesn't matter what happens, that natural rate of unemployment where the um, real wage chosen uh, in the wage setting is equal to the wage implied by price setting is the same, can only be in one spot, right? It can only be at that point A. And in, in, on the left-hand chart, it cannot be at that point. It cannot be at that point. It needs to be right in the middle. The natural rate of unemployment is at 10% in at the chart on the bottom left, it cannot be at five or fifteen percent because then there's an imbalance in that um, real wage uh, chosen versus the real wage implied. So again, we've dealt with the shifts. What can shift these curves? So the only thing really that can change the the or shift the WS, the wage setting curve, is changes in the bargaining position of workers. So at, at the bottom left, you'll see an example of, well, what's the impact on the wage setting of the natural, uh, uh, if there's an increase in the bargaining position of workers, so wage setting moves out, um, and then the natural rate, uh, oh, sorry, this, this is the other way around, actually. So, uh, well, no, it's, it's actually, no, it is that way. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, an improvement such as unemployment insurance, which then increases your bargaining position, right? So that shifts the um, WS curve out. Uh, you're still getting the same real wage at the natural rate of unemployment, but it increases the natural rate of unemployment because um, if there's more unemployment insurance, I can afford to be unemployed, right? So guess what happens if you give people more grants the unemployment rate goes up 
because why do I need to go work if I can receive a grant or uh, an, not necessarily a grant, uh, but an employment insurance? So if I had a job, I lose my job, I still get paid salary for a certain amount of period. It just increases that, call it the frictional unemployment, people that are between jobs, right? So so that, that's the very first thing. So if you have better bargaining position, unemployment, the natural rate of unemployment will increase, but actually the real wage received stays the same. Then the other one is shown at the bottom right. So a change in the markup results in a shift in the PS curve. Um, so an increase in the markup uh, shifts the PS curve downwards, right? So if the firm wants to make more profit, all else being equal, you'll get a lower real wage, right? That's that's what we dealt with when we talked about the, this example every year when the markup went from 0.1 to 0.2, so from 10% to 20% the curve shifted downwards um, over there in the middle in, in well, activity 8.5 point B, right? So the curve shifts downwards. If that curve shifts downwards, the natural rate, so the first relationship as well, the real wage decreases, right? But the natural rate of unemployment also increases because now it intersects at A1, no longer at A, it intersects at A1 because of that move. So um, those are really the, the two big factors that will uh, change the natural rate of unemployment, uh, bargaining position and the markup. So, I mean, in summary, and you'll find a very similar slide if you go to the summary, a summary of macroeconomic models. Uh, there's a very nice summary on the website. But um, I mean, in summary, the natural rate of unemployment can only be changed by shifts in either the wage setting or price setting curves, right? So that's what we've shown just now. A change in the unemployment rate will lead to a movement along the wage setting curve. So if it's just a change in the unemployment rate, we're not talking about natural rate of unemployment, just unemployment rate. So if the U moves around, that's just a shift, oh, sorry, a movement along. Uh, a change in other factors, such as bargaining position, uh, would cause a shift in the WS curve. So uh, increase in bargaining position is up and to the right. Decrease in bargaining position is down and to the left. A change in markup would lead to a shift in the PS curve. So that's really talk, talking about that. Uh, so an increase in the markup would cause a downward shift, a decrease in the markup, an uh, upward shift. But this really talks now to the key things that we've learned now, apart from being able to use the equations, but it's, well, unemployment rate is just a movement along, bargaining position is a shift, markup is a shift, right? And then at the equilibrium position, the targeted real wage implied by wage setting is equal to the real wa wage implied by price setting, and that is the natural rate of unemployment. So at that point A, where the two intersect, where they are the same. Finishing up with activity 8.6, which just puts a lot of this um, into practice, right? So again, don't frantically write down the answers. The answers are in, well, on the slide and in the study guide. But okay, looking at the first diagram, the diagram on the right, which looks quite familiar. We've actually seen and used this diagram a lot. Um, early on in, in the study guide. But um, OK, the first question, at which point is the implied real wage equal to the bargained real wage? So, well, OK, let's let's first say, OK, the implied real wage by price setting is this line. The bargained real wage is on wage setting. So at which point are they equal to one another? That's the intercept, right? At no other point are they equal to one another. That's the only point where You've got the 0 0.83 in the example here. And now the next question, which just to extent just follows on from that, but what's the natural rate of unemployment? So that is at that point, right? The unemployment rate at point B, what's the unemployment rate there? That's the natural rate of unemployment. That is 10%. So I think that's, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, if you, Okay, what is the implied real wage at the natural rate of unemployment? So, okay, at this 10%, which if you follow the 10% up, what is from the the, um, the implied real wage? Go up, 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 they intersect there. At that level, the implied real wage is 0 
So that's the way you kind of track it. You go up from that 10 percent to where they are there. Go to the left. That's 0.83. Okay. So next up, so okay, what is the bargained real wage at the natural rate of? Oh, sorry, that's the one we just did at E. At which point is the bargained real wage uh, higher than the implied real wage? Okay, so at which point is that? So at point, we just have three points here, right? So we can't say, I don't know, point B over there. It's, we've got point A, B, and C. At which point is the bargained um, real wage higher than the implied real wage? It's only really, so if I, okay, if I go from 10% up to B, that's 0.83. If I go from 15% up to C, that's 0.63, right? So that's lower. So the bargain rule wage is lower at point C. So the only place where it's higher is if I go from the 5% to point A at point A, the um, real wage is higher than at the natural rate of unemployment, right? So, or, or then the implied real wage. At which point is the bargain real wage lower? That's just the opposite. So at point C, that, that's lower than the implied real wage. Remember, implied real wage is this 0.83. So I hope that makes sense. This one is lower, that one's higher, point A, point C. Um, okay, so that's just navigating around this, this model that we've introduced in, in this um, in, in this uh, learning unit, right? Now, the next one is, well, okay, we now need to think about the shifts and we've talked about the shifts, we've introduced the shifts, we looked at them in the previous slide, and the, uh, but now, okay, the question is, well, show what would happen to the natural rate of unemployment if the bargaining position of workers were eroded. So in a lot of the previous ones, we said the bargaining position gets better. So this is eroded, meaning, gets worse. So the WS curve, right, if we just think about this, the if, if when things get better, the WS curve shifts to the right and up. If things get worse, it shifts down and to the left. So the WS curve, if you look at this chart on the bottom left, okay, the WS curve shifts down and to the left because the bargaining position gets eroded. So you go from WS to WS1, so it shifts down. Now, what happens to the natural rate of unemployment? The the PS curve, nothing happened to the P, the price setting curve because of the, this change, right? So the price setting curve stayed the same. The natural rate of unemployment would decrease at the end of the day um, be, because of this the shift in the WS curve, because of the shift in the wage setting curve. So yeah, it 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 feels a little bit counterintuitive if you your and employment decreased because your bargaining position were eroded, but this is actually quite true. You can actually see it in certain economies, as an example, in the US. In, in America, you as an employee have almost no bargaining position or no, no oh, sorry, no, no employee rights, you could almost say. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very liberal, open market. You can hire and fire as you please. And that means your bargaining position moved um basically down versus countries like south africa where it's actually very really difficult or um to, to hire or get rid of people so you, you end up in the us you end up hiring somebody because if it doesn't work out you can fire them again easily in south africa you end up not hiring a person because you're worried that you're stuck paying this person's salary for the next five years because you can't get rid of them even if your business idea didn't work so if the bargaining position eroded, the natural rate of unemployment actually decreases, right? But the firms still pay the same real wage. So last question here, show what would happen if to the natural rate of unemployment if firms were forced to de decrease their markup. So let's say the government forces ESCOM to change their pricing methodology, right? Or um, forces firms to cap the amount of profit they can charge on their chickens or, or whatever the case is. So, so you can make various examples of how they could do that. There might, there might be a monopoly or whatever the case is. But if firms uh, were forced to decrease their markup, that means the price setting relationship sh shifts upwards, right? Because we said there's a negative relationship with the markup and the real wage implied. So that means if you decrease your markup, the curve shifts up. 
In our previous examples, we had the opposite of that, but this is what happens if you decrease your markup, right? So PS shifts up. That also then means the natural rate of unemployment goes down. So that that's uh, shown on this chart here on the bottom right. Um, I hope that all makes sense. Uh, given that we are on eight o'clock, I'm not going to go through um, what's in the appendix, but be feel free to go through it um, in your own time. Just talks to um, concepts in the South African context. Um, the, there are certain things like the quarterly labor force survey. This is the one that you often would see the unemployment stats being read from. For those of you that are very interested in economics and tend on studying this further, I would suggest going uh, Googling the quarterly labor force survey, downloading it and going through it. It's quite interesting. I know I found it very interesting when I was a, an economics student, so I had to do a project on it once. I think this, the quarterly labor force survey, if I'm not mistaken, is released by Status A. The uh, QES, I think, is by the Reserve Bank. Slightly different methodologies, but I would suggest going through the quarterly labor force survey. Um, and activity 8.1 to 8.3, they're all, all there, but we did go through similar examples um, in uh, the presentation, which is why I didn't go through it, but it, it kind of just talks through some of the um, factors and gives you gives you some practical examples um, of what it could be uh, of what could drive um, bargaining position etc so feel free to go through those in your own time the answers are well in the presentation i think in the notes as well or in the study guide